Welcome back to the special relativity course. As mentioned in the previous lesson, in the last decade of the 19th century and the first years of the 20th century, physicists were trying to understand some aspects involving light and moving observers. At that time, physics was a strong and robust field. That has always been the case, by the way. That could explain from the motion of apples falling down to planets revolving around stars. The two main columns supporting the physics were classical mechanics, developed by Galileo, Newton and others, and the electromagnetic theory developed by Coulomb, Ampere, Faraday and others, and unified by Maxwell. This electromagnetic theory has shown that light is an electromagnetic wave that propagates at 300,000 kilometers per second. Both theories were very robust, but when trying to explain phenomena where both were relevant, they found some issues. For example, waves need a medium to propagate. Sound through air needs air molecules to propagate. The waves on a pond, they need water to propagate. Earthquakes are waves that propagate through the crust of the Earth. At the time, they thought that there should be a medium, so-called ether, so that light could propagate in space. We can see light from the stars, right? So a medium should permeate all of space. Experimentalists try to demonstrate, detect the existence of the ether. They wanted to find the wind of ether. When you run on a calm day without wind, because of your relative velocity with respect to the air molecules, you experience a wind. If the Earth is moving on this ether and the Earth is changing its direction of motion due to its spinning and its revolving around the Sun, we should be able to detect the effect of the wind of ether. They were performed very accurate experiments and they did not find evidence of the ether. That is because there is no such thing as the ether. There is something else going on. And it was Albert Einstein, the one who realized what it was and solved the conundrum of unifying classical mechanics, classical relativity, with electromagnetism. Einstein said that he needed 10 years to understand relativity and three weeks to write it down. That's not going to be your case, do not worry. He did the hard work for us. The reason for that is that it was a huge leap conceptually at that time, but the math is pretty simple. Let's jump into the details of Galilean relativity. Galileo Galilei was the first one to realize that there is no way we can design an experiment to distinguish if our frame of reference is addressed or if it's moving. A reference frame that is addressed or moving with uniform motion is called an inertial reference frame. And the fact that we think an inertial frame is addressed is just a matter of who is observing. I'm sitting at my desk, so I consider me and my desk be addressed. But for someone passing, hello, uh, that person might think that I am moving at a certain velocity with respect to that person. When you are driving at constant speed on the motorway, who is moving? You and your car forward, or is the whole Earth that is moving backwards? Remember that Newton's first law, introduced by Galileo first, says that an object addressed or in uniform motion will remain addressed or in uniform motion unless acted upon by an external force. At his time, there were ships as the smoothest and fastest vehicles. So he explained that you could go to the ship's hold with no windows, with all sorts of mechanical tools such as pendulums, springs, devices of dropping water to measure time, ratchets, inclines, even flies and birds. It is not possible to determine the motion of the ship as far as it is not accelerating. This is nicely explained in the movie Agora. When a spacius drops the sack, the boat will be moving forwards. Therefore, the sack won't fall at the foot of the mast, but will fall further back, I would say about, about here. And what is so special about that? Yes! Well, you were wrong! Yes, yes but this is the definitive proof. It's the 
definitive. The sack. The sack behaved as if the boat was stationary. What, is, what does that mean? I don't know. Well, relativity is the branch of physics that relates the measurements of an observer on a ship and an observer on shore. Imagine these two observers are each tracking the motion of the same point particle. Each one of these observers will measure time and position of that said particle, and the equations of relativity will make them agree in their results. These equations of relativity transform the numbers from one inertial reference frame to another inertial reference frame. Consider two observers, let's say Robert and Maggie. They're in relative motion with relative velocity v, observing the same particle move. To set the initial conditions and for simplicity, we will state that they both cross their paths such that at time t equals to zero, they are both at x equals to zero, and Robert moves on the positive x-axis with that velocity v. Robert and Maggie measure the position of the mentioned particle. Robert measures x sub r and Maggie measures x sub m. Because Robert is moving away from Maggie and towards the particle, the distance from Robert to the particle is different than the distance of Maggie to the particle. Explicitly, the relation between those positions is given by x sub m is equal to x sub r plus vt. The position measured by Maggie is the position measured by Robert plus the distance traveled by Robert towards the particle. If we represent this in a space and time graph, we see how those distances satisfy this equation. If we derive with respect to time to obtain the relationship between velocities, we obtain that the velocity sub m is equal to the velocity sub r plus v, which intuitively makes sense. Imagine you travel on a train at 100 km per hour and you throw a ball forward at 1 km per hour. For someone standing on the station, the velocity of the ball will be 101 km per hour, and if you throw it backwards, it will be 99 kilometers per hour. If we derive it again, we observe that the acceleration is the same as measured by both observers. Well, this is Galileo relativity. These equations can extend to three dimensions and any initial conditions. So now let's introduce the problem that physics, physics faced more than a century ago. Maxwell's electromagnetism theory concluded without needing to make any assumption, just naturally, that light is an electromagnetic wave traveling at 300 kilometers per second. But this speed is not referred to any specific reference frame. So what happens if you travel on a train at the speed of light and you turn on a torch pointing forward? This torch emits light at the speed of light. What would an observer at the station see? Would you see the light traveling at twice the speed of light? If you turn the torch backwards, will, it, will the observer see on the station that the light is stopped? Most physicists of the time assumed that that number for the speed of light was with respect to a universal preferred reference frame, which was the luminiferous ether. And they performed very sophisticated experiments to measure the speed of Earth across this ether. This ether needed to be a very light medium, otherwise it would have stopped the motion of the planet. But on the other hand, to allow such a high speed, it needed to be very rigid. Well, some physicists didn't have a problem accepting this. Some others knew that some profound changes needed to be done. See you in the next lesson and may the science be with you.